Parshat Vayeshev, which Willow read so beautifully today, thank you, Willow, uh, is filled with many themes and many relevant topics that we could learn from. The beauty of reading and studying the Torah portions every year, I find, is that while we read the very same text every year, we see it in a different light because we've changed. In this week's Parsha, we read about Jacob and his family with much time spent on Joseph's early days before he became Pharaoh's dream interpreter and later his viceroy. I decided to focus specifically on Joseph and his dreams and how his somewhat controversial dreams saved the Jewish people from famine. But first, we always like to put the Parsha in context. So Parshat Vaishlach, which was the week before, um, we hear about Jacob's journey back to the land of Canaan, his birthplace, with his very large family and his significant wealth. To prepare for his fateful reunion with Esau, Jacob first sent him a message seeking to please him and then sent him generous gifts to win him over. Jacob was so terrified that he sent his family and his possessions across the river first, thereby allowing him some time to contemplate how his reunion with his brother might go. <coughs> Jacob lay down to sleep beside the river, tossing and turning, wrestling with his thoughts, and perhaps with an angel in his dream, and woke up with the courage and conviction to face his brother Jacob, uh, to, to face his brother. Jacob was a changed man, and he now recognized his own flaws and his limitations and his past and had a mature perspective on what he needed to do next. So in this Parsha, Jacob is now the family patriarch. However, he's hardly the key actor in this week's story. Joseph is. Jacob is said to have been 91 years old when Joseph was born. Joseph was his favorite son, the son of his old age, as they say. Joseph's mother was Rachel, Jacob's favorite wife, who struggled to conceive. Jacob showed his love for Joseph by making a coat of many colors for him. You could write a Broadway musical about that, couldn't you? <laughs> Joseph was younger than most of his brothers with whom he didn't get along well. Certainly Jacob's display of his preference for Joseph deepened their jealousy. We meet 17-year-old Joseph and his dreams at the beginning of this week's Parsha. It's the dreams that make his brothers want to kill him, he said to them. And Willow chanted it so beautifully this morning. Hear this dream which I have dreamed. We were binding sheaves in the field when suddenly my sheaf arose and remained upright. And your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. And then he had another dream that Willow also told us about, but it was in Hebrew. Um, that Joseph had that the entire universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, they all paid homage to him. Here it's not Joseph's star that they bow to, as with his upright sheaf. Here they actually bow down to him. Significant turning points in Joseph's life are the result of dreams. His brother's hatred of him is exacerbated by his dreams, and he ends up abandoned by them in an empty but very deep pit. Joseph's ability to interpret dreams ensure, that, ensure his initial introduction to Pharaoh and his subsequent appointment to the position of Viceroy of Egypt. Do the dreams reflect Joseph's own personal ambition or are they prophetic? And if so, do they actually come true? We've seen God send messages to people through symbolic dreams. Recently we read about Jacob's dream of the ladder. Dreams are assumed to come from God. All the dreams that we read about in Joseph's story come in pairs. While in Egypt, Joseph explains later in Genesis, having the dream repeated means that the matter has been decided by God and that God will act swiftly to carry it out. This dream, in fact, does come true. Joseph rise, rises to power through wise planning of procurement of food, specifically grain, and later, when Joseph was the viceroy of Egypt, he sees his brothers bowing to him with respect. 
We are told that Joseph remembered these, the dreams that he had dreamed where his brothers had bowed down to him. Perhaps Joseph's dreams are not a personal ambition of ego and power, but rather a responsible leadership role. He's a born leader and a very talented and capable one. He has personal charisma, charm. No sooner than he arrives as a slave in Egypt does he rise to status in the home of a prominent Egyptian official running his entire business. He's attractive, attracts the attention of women. People in power are attracted to him, and he's unusually successful at managing the, their affairs. He organizes Potiphar's house, is said to later manage the prison where he's held. All this training helped him to run the entire Egyptian infrastructure through seven famine years and to emerge with a profit and increase strength. Joseph and his somewhat controversial dreams saved the Jewish people from famine. Oxford Dictionary defines dreams as a series of thoughts, images, and sensations occurring in a person's mind during sleep. Their second definition was about a cherished aspiration, an ambition, or an ideal. I'd like to focus on the latter, um, sharing some examples of how we dream and plan at Holy Blossom Temple. Three specific Holy Blossom Temple achievements from this past year relate to membership, our new code of, of ethics, and our strategic plan. And they have resulted from or are a key tool that we use when we dream. So let me tell you a bit about it. But before that, we did more than that last year. Um, there were certain notable and exciting achievements and celebrations, including the outstanding work of our newly revitalized foundation, as well as the celebration of Rabbi Splansky's 25 years as a rabbi. So we know how to have fun, too. If you want to learn more about the programs, the activities, the classes, the courses, the lectures, worship experience that we engaged in this year, you can read about it in the very detailed and phenomenally exciting reports from all the Holy Blossom departments on our website. So don't worry, I'm not going to tell you all of that, but we did um, share those at our annual general meeting, the reports but they are now on our website for you to read. But our first notable achievement this year that I want to tell you about relates to membership. Holy Blossom Temple members are growing in number, and I've been told that we're growing younger. Unofficially, our total number of member households, that is, households that have renewed, rejoined after being away from us for a while, or including new members, we've increased almost 5% over the last year. That's a pretty amazing achievement, given how many faith-based organizations are experiencing declines in their membership. This year, we, we welcomed over 150 new member households. I've been told we're up to 165, and it keeps on growing. Um, an increase of approximately 85% in terms of new households over the previous year. To that, I say, wow. And I'm sure some of you are here with us and we're online, and I say welcome. We're very, very glad that you're here. We experienced similar growth rate in the number of our Truma households this year as well. Holy Blossom's Truma membership program is designed for families whose oldest child is eight years or younger, and it helps families balance their needs with support from the congregation. It's a personalized approach and it allows each family to determine the membership contribution that works for them. It isn't tied to the age of the parents. Our focus on, on young families and young professionals at Holy Blossom this year has been deliberate and part of our strategic plan. This year we hired Rabbi Taylor Baruchel as the Director of Outreach and Next Gen Engagement. She has been reaching out and engaging current and prospective young professionals and young families with a relationship management approach, one-by-one -one coffee dates, and progressively expanding programs such as Tot Shabbat and Sunday Fun Days. Word of mouth has helped to bring in more prospective members thanks to these types of activities and programs by Rabbi Baruchel and 
all our other clergy and professionals. We haven't calculated the average age of a Holy Blossom Temple member yet, but I think I'd like to believe we are getting younger. This year, we also undertook another really important project. Together with other reform congregations across North America, we documented a congregational code of ethics. The value-based code of ethics sets out principles and expectations for adherence to standards of conduct for our community. This would apply to congregants, lay leaders, professional staff, clergy, visitors, guests, whether they're participating in a temple activity or an event that's on our premises, online, or off-site. The synagogue is a sacred space that serves as a spiritual home for all who enter its doors. Its, sanct its sanctity and strength, in turn, depend largely on the degree to which everyone in our community acts according to these reform Jewish values. And when they do, the synagogue remains a safe space in which to engage with one another in sacred partnership. The Holy Blossom Temple Board approved the Code of Ethics together with a number of other important internal policies uh, last spring, and we're now working to prepare for the training and the communication of the, of the Code of Ethics, commencing with training in late January of 2024 of all our senior staff, the Board of Directors, members of the various Holy Blossom committees that will be involved in managing the code of ethics when there are concerns and complaints when they arise. And we have further training planned for other Holy Blossom staff, including teachers, to follow later. The code of ethics will be made available to the community on our website and from the temple's main office early in 2024. So those are two. Let me tell you about another achievement. I talked about it a little bit last year, but I'd like to share where we're going with it. So the third one is our strategic plan. It's a key tool for us to take our dreams and our visions and work to achieve them. Over the past 12 months, Holy Blossom Temple Board and our clergy and staff partners have focused on implementing our three-year strategic plan that was first presented to the congregation at our annual general meeting last year and I talked about it here last year as well. The plan comprises 29 strategic initiatives that underpin, underpin the following six strategic directions. Building a sacred community, developing our people, cultivating Jewish experiences, celebrating our stories, improving our home, and ensuring financial health, our financial health. We focused this year on 10 of the 29 strategic initiatives that related to attracting new congregants, recruiting and developing leaders, enhancing the Shabbat experience, reinvigorating youth education and family engagement, updating our communication strategy, reopening the Philip and now Fannie Smith Congregational Hall, as well as four initiatives to improve our financial health. In fact, when you read the department reports, you may think that we've actually accomplished all 29 of our strategic initiatives. There's so much that we've been working on. Following good governance practices, we're currently reviewing our progress, refocusing our plan for next year, as strategic plans are designed to be living documents. I expect we'll add more strategic initiatives from our list and continue with all those other ones that we've started. Holy Blossom Temple goals and dreams are not as lofty as Martin Luther King's who called for civil and economic rights and an end to racism in the U United States. Or Theodore Herzl's, who was the father of modern Zionism, who knew it, that it takes a dream to save the Jewish people. We have dreams that manifest themselves in documents, such as our strategic plan and at board meetings where we focus on many aspects of our future, our members, our staff, finances, programs, worship, our space, our community, Israel. Joseph's story taught us that it takes more than luck for dreams to turn out as anticipated. It takes personal intervention rather than passively waiting for an outcome to turn dreams into reality. And to improve the odds of realizing dreams, it's helpful to remember Theodore Herzl who said, 
Im Tirzu ein so agada. If you will it, it is no dream. Not only do we dream about Holy Blossom, but some of us dream about the reform movement. Um, next week, the Union for Reform Judaism, the umbrella group for all North American reform congregations, is gathering in Washington to celebrate the, hundred and, hun, the past 150 years as a reform movement. And at that gathering, we're going to look back on what dreams and dreamers have shaped the past and look ahead to the vision and the imagination, our dream, that will guide our future in North America and Israel and around the world. Members of Holy Blossom Temple have been and continue to be very active in the leadership of the reform movement worldwide. We look forward to dreaming of what the next 50 years will be with the URJ, Union for Reform Judaism, and bringing home ideas so that we can continue dreaming here and doing here in Canada, in Toronto, and at Holy Blossom. Let me just conclude with a few thank yous. I am part of a terrific leadership leadership team with Rabbi Splansky, our senior rabbi, and Rachel Malik, our executive director. Don't know. She's at the back. There she is. Thank you, Rachel. Um, representing our talented clergy and professional teams that support them. I'm blessed to not only have a strong board who were installed with me today, but as well a team of incredible vice presidents who will be with me every step of the way. Let me also mention my senior vice president, who seems to be wandering here, uh, and successor, Eric Rohr. He's already getting ready to lead. I, I can leave now and you can run it. Um, Eric has been and will be helping me to lead and I will help him to learn the ropes because we're strong believers in sharing the load and succession planning. I'd like to also thank all past presidents of Holy Blossom Temple, some of whom are here today, who've been so helpful to me in my first year as president. I also thank my friends and of course my husband Jeff, who does more than just chant Torah, as you all know, my daughter Beth and son Robin, daughter-in-law Valerie for their support. It takes a village. Following in the footsteps of our biblical leaders who answered the call to lead the Jewish people, I say Hineni. I am here, I'm committed, I'm engaged to lead Holy Blossom Temple, continuing the legacy of the incredible men and women who've led this congregation before me. I look forward to working with all of you in this sacred partnership. I want to wish you all a and your loved ones peace, light, and warmth. I think we'll sing about that. Chag Urim Sameach. Happy Chanukah. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.